Last up, Ripple CEO suggests Chinese President Xi Jinping could roll back Bitcoin. This is an interesting prospect. So there's one part here that I just don't agree with uh, Brad with, kind of. And the second part, I totally do. So this is what is going on. This was a virtual conversation during this year's DC FinTech Week conference. And I'll boil it down. This is what Brad Garlinghouse, the CEO of Ripple, said. He says, what happens if Premier Xi, Xi Jinping, loses a million dollars in Bitcoin? Like, let's just say he bought a million dollars of Bitcoin, apparently. And <clears throat> even though he's the president, for some reason, he loses his nano ledger or he forgets his passphrase. I don't know. And he loses a million dollars. Brad states, you don't think that the Chinese Communist Party has the opportunity to affect the change to the Bitcoin blockchain and make a reverse premier's easy a million dollar loss of Bitcoin that might have been hacked. So what he's saying here is that if the and I get the context, right? He's just, he's, this is, this is hyperbole. This is, he's way out there. The president loses a million dollars. He's like, hey, I lost a million bucks. Roll that back. Uh, roll the whole thing back. And the way that we're going to do it is because we have so many miners in China. Now, just wait before you blow up at the screen. I'll get to that in a second. His arguments mirror the controversial op ed by ex Ripple CEO Chris Larson. has been widely criticized by Bitcoiners. What did he say? Let's just get to it. So this was a, a little op-ed piece in The Hill uh, where Chris Larson, ex-CEO of Ripple, I guess he's uh, moved on, but it's still probably an advisor. Here's what he said. He said, look, the Chinese government is also subsidizing the vast amounts of energy needed to fuel cryptocurrency miners in the country. Mining is one way to verify blockchain transactions where individuals or companies solve complex mathematical problems for crypto in return. At least 65% of cryptocurrency mining is concentrated in China, which means the Chinese government has a majority needed to wield control over those protocols and can be effectively blocked or reverse transactions. So if this was eight months ago, I would have totally agreed with this and I would have you know, blasted uh, uh, Bitcoin for that. However, on this channel, I like to dig into the comments and I like to do premieres and I like to talk to people. And uh, what I had was a lot of miners who were mining Bitcoin said, that's BS, man. And they told me this is what's going on because I'm not a miner. I don't know if you are. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. This is what the miners have told me and they've been telling me this for, for months. They say, look, our job is to find the mining pool with the cheapest electricity. That way we can get the best rates for selling our Bitcoin. Great. China has pretty good rates in uh, Xinjiang. I forgot which province it was, but they have a lot of hydroelectricity and it's super cheap. It's like less than a penny for kilowatt hour. So they go, what we're going to do is we're going to connect to those mining pools and we're going to connect our rigs to them. And then we can turn out Bitcoin and make a profit. That's great. But we can at any time, any moment, disconnect from those pools and go to any other one that we want to. We can go to one in America. We can go to Kazakhstan. We can go to Iran, wherever. It doesn't matter. Wherever the mining pool is, that's where we can connect to. So when they say that, oh, well, you know, China can definitely uh, reverse these things, they can't. They can't because it's not where the mining pool is located, which they are. A lot of these mining pools are located in China. Uh, this is an old one, but uh, yeah, you get the gist of it. So pool in, 18% of blocks based in China, F2 pool based in China, BTC.com based in China, and pool based in China. So you're looking at a big wide swath, right? Uh, looks like 63% or whatever it was. However, just like I said, uh, the miners themselves, they can connect to these pools, but they can disconnect as well. So for them to say that China can do this, not so fast. However, there's two caveats. So I asked them this, well, if the job of the miners are to find the cheapest electricity and the cheapest electricity is in China, why wouldn't everybody just go to China? And they say, yeah, I got a point, we do do that. Which is true, right? Uh, it's all about making a profit. So if you're looking at the place for the cheapest electricity, which is the biggest determining factor, then you probably go to the, some of these Chinese pools. So that's one option. However, they came back and said this, look, Rob, if we, if they are using our rigs to do a 51% attack and they are reversing transactions, that will destroy the whole system. If they destroy the whole system, then the price of Bitcoin goes way down. And so all the different things that we're doing for mining, we're mining Bitcoin, we want to sell this for a profit. So if it goes from 10,000 to 2,000, that's not good for us. So we're going to disconnect and we're going to go someplace else. So I was like, hmm, that's also a good point. So anyhow, that's the whole mining situation that we have. Let me know what you think in the comment section. But there was one thing uh, that I had to really think about with what Brad said. It comes to into play in the very end. He says, CBCs don't solve the problem. And he said, when asked to weigh in on the rise of CBDCs, which we just talked about, Garlinghouse called it a very positive dynamic, while also arguing that they do not pose a threat to Ripple or XRP. Let me say that again. They do not pose a threat to Ripple or XRP. So you're thinking, well, how is that? 
He states, just having a central bank, digital currency, still doesn't solve the problem of settling a transaction, settling a payment between the Argentinian peso and the Australian dollar. And he's right. He's right. Because uh, blockchains are great for security. They're great for decentralization. They're great for censorship, censorship resistance. They're great for the future. However, what they're not great for is talking amongst themselves. So you can't get the data from one blockchain to another blockchain. So if you have a CBDC and they're all on a blockchain, well, how are you going to have the digital yuan talk to the digital euro? How are you going to have the digital peso talk to the digital dollar? Well, you're going to need something to settle those transactions. That something could be XRP. Could be, I will say. However, there's another, another ace in the hole. It's called on-demand liquidity. The things with banks as far as the dirty fiat is to transfer that money. Uh, all over the globe if you want to be in that corridor. So here's an example. If I want to send $1,000 to Mexico, uh, I can do that, but my bank has to pre-fund those banks in Mexico with dollars or pesos or whatever, and it has to be done vice versa. So if you're a bank, you have to fund that all the way throughout the world uh, if you want to be in those corridors, wherever you want to be. So uh, with XRP, you don't have to do that. It's on-demand liquidity, essentially meaning that uh, since the transactions happen so quick, less than five seconds, I mean, they're very fast. I will give them that. Uh, you don't need to pre-fund anything, and you can free up that money, do whatever you want to. Now, that is just one factor. I know some people love XRP, and some people hate XRP. So I'm not going to get in between that environment. I just want to tell you what it is. Me personally, I still a whole, I still own XRP, and I also own Stellar. I don't know which one's going to win. I XR, or Stellar's got some great news recently, as they are uh, part of the IMF in the meeting itself, and. Uh, they just uh, announced support for the USDC, so Stellar is going to be able, to, or USDC is going to be able to use the Stellar network for transactions, and uh, that is big news, I think. So look, that's it. So I want to say, hey, thanks for sticking with me through the entire video. Really appreciate it. Uh, also, if you got time, sometime. Come over to Theta. Uh, take a look at the description uh, below for all my videos. It's going to say follow Dan. There's going to be a link for my Theta channel, and we do a lot of live streams. We try to do one every day, around 11 a.m., 12 p.m. Uh, Mountain Standard Time. And we just talk about things that are going on right now, but also a lot of interaction, get to ask questions, uh, get to get some great insight for what people are telling me. So uh, stop on by if you got time. Really appreciate that. So uh, that is it. If you like these types of videos, there's going to be two more going to pop up on your left and right. Not sure which one. YouTube kind of controls most of that. And uh, check those out. So that's it. Thanks so much. See you on the next one.